Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the entrance of the University Mace, escorted by USC Columbia student body president, Reedy Newton. Dr. Rusty L. Munholland, President of the, of, of, the, of the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education. President Rosalind C. Artis, Benedict College. President Gene C. Fant, Jr., North Greenville University. President Steve Pettit, Bob Jones University. President Michael T. Benson, Coastal Carolina University. President Walter A. Tobin, Orangeburg Calhoun Technical College. Representatives of the university faculty, led by Dr. Audrey Korsgaard, Chair of the USC Columbia Faculty Senate. The University Deans, led by Dr. Donna K. Arnett, Executive Vice, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost. The University System Chancellors, led by J. Darren Cole, Vice President for System Affairs. Trustees, led by Dr. Luther Cameron Howell IV, Secretary to the Board of Trustees.
the Presidential Medallion, escorted by the Honorable Thad H. Westbrook, Chair of the Board of Trustees. The Platform Party. The Governor of the State of South Carolina, the Honorable Henry D. McMaster. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the University of South Carolina, Dr. Michael D. Amaritis. Good morning. Welcome to the investiture of Dr. Michael Amaritas as the University of South Carolina's 30th president. My name is Thad Westbrook and I serve as chair of the university's board of trustees. This is an occasion of historic importance for the university in the state of South Carolina. For many of us, this is an occasion of professional and personal importance as well, signaling the completion of one phase of work and engagement at the university, along with the beginning of a new phase of work and engagement. This morning, all of us will witness the first words in a new chapter of the university's illustrious history. If you would please be seated. On behalf of the board, I want to recognize some special guests and groups of guests. Please join me in welcoming the university's first lady who holds two graduate degrees from USC Dr. Iro Angelopoulou Amaritas. <laughs> Michael and Iro's son, Dimitri, also a USC graduate, joins us this morning. Michael and Eero's daughter, Aspasia, another USC graduate, cannot be with us, but she's watching the ceremony online. Good morning, Aspasia. <laughs> Other special family and friends of Michael and Eero are visiting Columbia for this important occasion. Please join me in welcoming the guests of the Amaritas family. It is the university's honor today to welcome Her Excellency Alexandra Papapathulu, Ambassador of Greece to the United States. Thank you for traveling to Columbia for this important occasion for the university. His Excellency, Governor Henry McMaster is with us today and he is a dual degree holder from the university. With us are many members of the South Carolina Senate, led by its president, Senator Thomas Alexander. We are also joined by many members of the South Carolina House of Representatives, led by its speaker, Merle Smith. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We're pleased to have mayors, along with city council and county council members from communities across the state where the university operates its campuses. We're especially happy to be joined by the university's 28th president, Harris Pastides. <laughs> to all University of South Carolina students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of the university, 
The Board of Trustees thanks you for being at the Koger Center this morning for this special event in the history of your university. Thanks also to the stakeholders and members of the public who are watching this ceremony online. We are pleased that you all have decided to participate in this momentous event at your university pauses to enact the ceremony to install and honor your new president. With all, will all attendees now stand and remain standing as the University of South Carolina Concert Choir and Symphony Orchestra lead us in the national anthem, followed by the invocation delivered by His Eminence, Archbishop Elpithiphoros of America. His Eminence, Archbishop Elpithophoros of America. Let us pray with and for one another. O Lord of the ages and creator of the universe, we give thanks to you today for your servant, Michael, for his family, and for the greater family of the University of South Carolina, over which he now presides. As he has fulfilled in his own lifetime the ancient injunction, en Aristevin, to ever excel, grant that he may inspire every member of this academic community to exceed their expectations, to reveal their greatest talents, and to embrace the life and people of the great state of South Carolina through inclusion, participation, and the respect of true mutuality. Grant unto him the spirit of understanding, a prudent and virtuous mind, and the wisdom that comes from you, the font of all knowledge and mystery. Bless this university, captained by President Amiridis, with health, prosperity, tranquility, and above all, vision. For you are the wellspring of every blessing and gracious gift, and to you we ascribe glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Your Eminence, and thank you to all members of the University Concert Choir and Symphony Orchestra. On Saturday, December 19th, 1801, 
The South Carolina General Assembly, in its wisdom, committed to the establishment of a state-supported institution of higher education in Columbia. The General Assembly adopted, quote, an act to establish a college at Columbia, and introduced that act with the following preamble, quote, whereas the proper education of youth contributes greatly to the prosperity of society, and ought always to be an object of legislative attention, and whereas the establishment of a college in a central part of the state, where all its youth may be educated, will highly promote the instruction, the good order, and the harmony of the whole community." Close quote. Since its inception, this institution of higher education has defined its purpose as educating students in harmony with the whole community, which can be defined as the entire state of South Carolina. That purpose informs this morning's proceedings as we gather for the investiture of Dr. Amaritas as the 30th president of the university. The term investiture, first employed in a religious context, described when religious officials and eventually secular officials were granted powers through ceremonial and symbolic vestments or robes. We see the importance of ceremonial robes in the academic regalia worn by the president, trustees, institutional guests, and faculty this morning. The robes denote certain standing and the hoods denote academic accomplishment. This morning, in this investiture ceremony, the University of South Carolina Board of Trustees will grant formal authority to Michael Amarius to perform the duties of president as delegated by the board to the president. And as the 1801 Enabling Act reminds us, we are empowered by the state to provide instruction to students in harmony with the whole community, the entirety of South Carolina. This is a public university with a public mission. This morning's investiture is a public event carried out with representatives of the community to signify the promise of the university's mission to the public and to all of our communities across the state. In essence, this event symbolizes a renewal of the university's compact with the state to support and better all of our communities. And it symbolizes all of our community's commitment, as evidenced by your presence here today, to support and better the University of South Carolina. As such, during the following portion of this morning's ceremony, public leaders, the university community, and representatives of the national higher education community will issue greetings to the university and the new president. At this time, to begin these greetings, we're privileged to welcome to the podium His Excellency, the governor of the great state of South Carolina, Henry McMaster. I'm waiting to see if my words are going to be up there because I just thought them up. I don't think they're going to be on there. <laughs> well, look, all right, there they are. <laughs> I'm honored to bring greetings today to this great university and President Michael Amaritis from the 5,200,000 proud, happy South Carolinians in our state. Our state is booming with enormous promise and abundant resources from the mountains to the sea. But as our state motto teaches, we must be prepared not only in resources, but also in mind to fulfill that promise. It is for that reason that this university is essential. It is for that promise that we, the children of Carolina, breathe and hope. It is because the health and strength of this institution guides the success and happiness of our people that I'm happy today to bring greetings to the leaders and lovers of this historic university and its new president, Dr. Michael Amaritas. Congratulations. Dr. Audrey Korsgaard, Chair of the USC Columbia Faculty Senate. Dr. Amaritis, on behalf of the faculty of the University of South Carolina, I am pleased and honored to greet you, and I share with you our warm regards. The faculty are an essential resource for the university's pursuit of its mission to discover, innovate, and educate. For more than 220 years, the University of South Carolina has helped shape future generations of leaders 
in science, technology, business, the arts, and countless other fields. It has become a strong partner to communities throughout the state. It has risen to national and international prominence in research and scholarship in numerous fields of inquiry. Today, through education, discovery, and innovation, the university plays a key role in the economic prosperity of this state and our nation. Under your leadership, the faculty stand ready to uphold and further this mission and vision of the university. We are on a threshold of a new era in public education. The University of South Carolina faces many challenges and opportunities that will demand vision, commitment, and resilience. With your leadership, the faculty stand ready to face these challenges and seize the opportunities that will propel the university to even greater prominence. The faculty wish you well in your efforts as president. We are eager to work with you to further the institution's mission and achieve new levels of excellence. We look forward to your vision and guidance and working together for the betterment of the university. Welcome. Dr. Rashandra James, Chair of the USC Columbia Staff Senate. To President and First Lady Amaritas, the Board of Trustees, distinguished platform guests, and all of you, I bid you good morning. I bring you greetings on behalf of the nearly 60% of employees classified as staff here at the University of South Carolina. As staff, we are invested in the university as not only our place to work, but as a community, a place where we grow, learn, and explore our passions. For us, Carolina is home. When thinking of a leader for a place many of us hold so dear, we consider the traits of compassion, innovation, kindness, and a love for the people. When hearing of your selection as our new president, we were elated. Your reputation preceded you in all of the good ways. There's an adage that says, if you want to know what someone will do, look at what they have done. And because of what you have already accomplished, both here at USC and at the University of Illinois Chicago, we knew we were getting a compassionate, innovative, and kind leader who appreciates our beloved university and all that we serve. And we were correct. We look forward to our continued work together as we serve the students, faculty, and citizens of South Carolina blazing uncharted territory and building upon an already amazing legacy that we can continue to be proud of. Congratulations, President Amaritas, and thank you. Durham Cole, Vice President for System Affairs. Mr. President, on behalf of the chancellors, the deans, the faculties, the staff, and the students at the universities and colleges in the University of South Carolina system, I am honored to bring greetings and a warm welcome home to you and First Lady Amaritas. The university has long been considered a faithful index to the ambitions and fortunes of the state of South Carolina. And indeed, the points composing this index span the entire state, from Aiken to Beaufort to Columbia to Upstate to Lancaster, Salkahatchee, Sumter, and Union. Perhaps drawing on your distinguished academic background in engineering, you have described the University of South Carolina system as our network. And we look forward to supporting and implementing your vision to harness, cultivate, and leverage the power and potential of the system to support the ambitions and fortunes of the state of South Carolina for the next 200 years, just as we have done since the university's founding in 1801. Congratulations and best wishes to you as you lead the university in this next chapter of its distinguished history. Reedy Newton, USC Columbia Student Body President. A 
As president of the student body, it is my honor and privilege to be here today and be a part of the special investiture ceremony as we recognize the 30th president of the University of South Carolina. On behalf of the graduate and undergraduate students across the system, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Michael Amaritis and Dr. Iro Agalupolo Amaritis home to our Carolina community and family. I'm so proud to be part of such a driven, diverse, and passionate student body. Our student experience at Carolina is uniquely meaningful, and our new president and first lady know this firsthand through their own student experience and through their children's experiences. Serving as student body president, I've had the opportunity to work alongside President Emeritus, and has been a priority for me to show him what an amazing group of students we have. During my time with him over the last seven months, I've witnessed how student-focused and student-centric he is, as he actively seeks out student input and feedback. And not only has he spent this fall's football season waving his rally towel with us in the student section, but he has years of previous experience leading Carolina students. And I know that this new relationship with the student body will continue to grow for years to come. It has been truly inspiring to watch President Amaritas value student interests in the way that he does, treating students as equals and as stakeholders of our university. President Amaritas and First Lady Amaritas, on behalf of the student body, Thank you for what you have already done and for what I know you will continue to do. Scott Moes, USC Alumni Association President. Good morning, I'm Scott Moise, President of the University of South Carolina Alumni Association. President Amaritas, Governor McMaster, trustees, special guests, and all of you in attendance today, including on video, it is my honor to bring greetings on behalf of more than 340,000 system graduates. I want to tell you a story about the first time I met President Amaritas and how I knew then that he would be a great president for our university and our alumni association. My husband and I were um, at a reception at the Alumni Center in July when President Amaritas walked up to say hello. My husband had a question. How do you pronounce the president's name? Being Greek, four syllables, and lots of I's in there. And I thought, oh dear, what if the president is annoyed by this? But instead of getting annoyed, the president just smiled, he leaned over and whispered, it's easy, just call me Michael. <laughs> I knew then that beyond his impeccable credentials and experience, our new president was gonna be a great fit and that our alumni were going to love him. And President Amaritas proved me right by immediately contacting our association, asking us to set up coming home to Carolina tours across the state and country, which we did and continue today. At these events, the president has talked tirelessly with and listened to over a thousand alumni who always keep him late asking questions, giving opinions, and getting pictures. And we know he's met thousands more alumni at athletic events in communities across the state and out here at a dinner in Columbia. The sentiment is resounding. Our alumni love President Amaritas, and we're so happy to have him and Eero here at Carolina. In closing, I want to thank you, President Michael Amaritas, and welcome back home to Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome guest speaker, Dr. Robert J. Jones, Chancellor of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Vice President of the University of Illinois System. Good morning. I'm a Southerner. <laughs> we used to call and response, so let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. Let me start by saying it is certainly my great pleasure and a privilege to take part in this investiture celebration of Dr. Michael Amaritas as the 30th president of the University of South Carolina. I would be remiss if I didn't thank 
Governor McMaster and Chair Westbrook and the entire Board of Trustees for allowing me to offer some brief remarks at this historic moment for this university and for this entire state. Let me start by saying I began working with Michael when I became Chancellor of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2016. And even though he's no longer there, I have to always remind him that Urbana-Champaign is the land-grant flagship university of the University of Illinois system. We're still friends, right? So I came there in 2016 when Michael was the chancellor of our sister institution, an amazing urban land-grant university called the University of Illinois Chicago. We started out together leading our respective and sibling universities through, universities through the worst budget crisis in our state's history. At one point, the two-year-plus uh, budget impasse had that it failed to deliver nearly $1 billion in promised support. Not the best way to start a new job. And just as we had emerged and start to rebuild from that, we found ourselves facing an even greater existential threat with the worst of human crisis and living memory, COVID-19. Now, I don't know how it is here in Carolina, but in my experience at several other institutions across my career, the individual campuses within a university system can sometimes be a little, shall we say, competitive with one another. So I think it is probably safe to say that Michael and I begin our relationship as a part of the University of Illinois system as cautious colleagues. But seven years later, when he headed back here to Columbia and left the University of Illinois, he left as one of my most trusted colleagues, a partner in academic excellence, and perhaps most importantly, a really close friend. But my personal disappointment at Michael's departing is heavily outweighed by my professional excitement about the even greater national impact that he will have in helping American higher education system address what I think is the single greatest and most important challenge. So now I want to be very, very clear before I make my statement. I fundamentally believe that American higher education system is the best in the world, always has been and remains so today. But the hardest and the honest truth is that our system today is leaving far, far too many people behind. So the issues of access and affordability and achievability of, our, of a college education must be real for everyone. Access to a university shouldn't be limited by what your parents earn or by the good fortune of where you happen to live it is a human right and is a fundamental building block for our national economic and social development. I fundamentally believe that we must prioritize our investment and our recruitment and retention strategies toward these populations who are at the most social economic risk and who lacks the resources and the support structure. And for anyone questioning that, let me be very, very clear. Prioritizing populations will never mean taking away opportunities from others. The belief that we can lift up one segment of our community only at the expense of another is a shameful, insidious, and it's a fallacy that is taking unacceptable roots across far too much of our society. If we do nothing else as universities, we must emphatically and permanently shatter that lie that the educational opportunity is a zero-sum game. And we are at a point in time where there's a sense of urgency, I believe, to act. We cannot just continue to talk about these issues. We need university leaders who are willing and ready to be accountable for making this a reality. And that's exactly who you have in your new president. 
Michael came to UIUC to lead the most important public university in one of the most important cities in the country. He elevated it to a new level of achievement and dramatically increased access to a world-class academic experience. UIC's enrollment increased to a record level under his leadership. It established itself as the second largest provider of college degrees in the state of Illinois to Illinois residents. More impressively, the enrollment increase brought about a 58% increase in students who were from underrepresented population. In fact, under his leadership, UIC, UIC earned the U.S. Department of Education designation as a Hispanic-serving institution. And he didn't stop there. He led the university in a consortium of 16 universities, research one universities, I might add, to initiate a structure that will dramatically increase the number of Hispanic students who will earn doctor degrees and go on to enter the professoriate. He also secured the largest individual private gift in UIC's history, $40 million, a $40 million donation from the philanthropist Mackenzie Scott. This gift was channeled directly into programs and support to do exactly what I've been talking about, to increase the enrollment in of first generation and the engagement and graduation of low-income students. And during his tenure, Michael also led to transformation of the massive, and I mean massive, UIC health and clinical medical enterprise to focus on delivering high-quality medical services and health care to some of the poorest and the most deserving communities across greater Chicago area communities where many of the new students had chose to live when they joined the University of Illinois Chicago, a place that they call their home. So let me just sum that up by saying that under his leadership, more deserved Chicago area students, more families saw their health care improve and their wellness improve. And more of those students enroll than ever. There were more students enrolled than ever in the history of this university with greater diversity. They were more academically successful and persistent, and they graduated at higher rates, and they left with less debt. So this is the kind of guy you're getting. This is the guy that you have as your president. So if you want a blueprint, a blueprint to create, for creating and growing and sustaining a strong and higher education system in the U.S., Michael Lamaritas drew it up, wrote the manual, and is clearly prepared to implement that big blueprint here in the months and the years ahead. So the University of South Carolina and Michael Emery is together. Truly, this is a case of exactly the right person in the exactly the right place at exactly the right time. You have positioned yourself to create a brighter, more accessible, and more successful future for the families of children from this state. But as impressive as all of his academic accomplishments have been, I truly believe you have an even more powerful reason to trust him to lead this university forward at this pivotal point in time. To Michael, this is far more than just a tremendous professional opportunity to lead an amazing university. This is the place where he grew up in so many ways that matter. As a faculty member, as an administrator, as a member of the community, this is the place that gave him the experience and the chance that took him to UIC and now has brought him back to you. And who says you can't come home again? The university is Michael's home, and the faculty and staff at the students and alumni of this university you're all part of this great family. And we all know that there's nobody for whom you, that will work harder to reach higher heights for you and for this entire fierce family here in South Carolina than Michael Amaritas. So Michael, on behalf of all of my colleagues across public higher education in particular, congratulations to you. 
We could not be more proud of you, and we will still be keeping an eye on the great things that you would achieve during your tenure at this university, and thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome guest speaker, Dr. Mark Becker, President of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Yeah. It is my honor and privilege to return to the University of South Carolina to participate in the investiture of my dear friend and colleague, Michael Amaritas. It seems like only yesterday, and yet it was nearly 19 years ago, that Michael served on the search committee that recruited me to be the provost of this great institution. That was the beginning of our relationship, and it was the point from which I started to witness Michael's rise as an academic leader who was at the forefront of American higher education. The University of South Carolina is where he began his academic career, an institution that he has given most of his adult life to, he loves and cherishes. I am excited for the Gamecock Nation. Your best days are ahead of you. Transitions in leadership frequently stimulate conversations examining the future. And in higher education, those con conversations tend to focus on the future of the institution, in this case, the University of South Carolina, and the future of higher education itself. The University of South Carolina has a proud history of success, and I take it as a given that the university will strive to build on that foundation to continue the pursuit of excellence and impact. However, notwithstanding past achievements and current strengths, looking to the future, we are confronted with a world full of pain, suffering, conflict, and injustice. Wars, inflation, the prospect of a recession on the horizon, social fragmentation and political polarization, energy and food challenges, changing weather patterns and historic weather events, grave tensions among the world's superpowers, and much more. We are emerging from a global pandemic that has killed more than six and a half million people worldwide. Our democracy has been shaken in ways none of us has experienced before. And the public trust and confidence in the value and importance of higher education are lower than I have ever seen. The challenges and the challenges that President Amaritus and this university will face going forward are daunting. However, it is in a world of difficulties and challenges that opportunities to create and innovate abound. And I take it as an obligation that our public research universities are integral to the future of their communities, states, and nation. For more than 200 years, we have overcome adversity as an enduring force for progress. And that is what we must do today. Our universities create the future. There are obvious opportunities in front of us. We are committed to academic excellence. And with rapidly advancing technologies, the opportunities to innovate in education and learning, are at our fingertips. This includes and is not limited to advances in artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, communications and computing power, and biotechnology. For example, the vaccines we have for COVID-19 would have not been possible were it not for mRNA research that made the rapid development of safe and effective vaccines possible in record time. Millions more people likely would have died if not for the scientific and technological breakthroughs behind those vaccines. And this is but one example. There is so much more that we can do within our universities, both to improve learning and to conduct research and scholarship that improves lives. But the challenge that has me most concerned is the declining trust and confidence that the American people have in higher education. We often hear talk of our politically polarized nation. Well, that may be the case on some matters, perhaps many. It is evident that there is a bipartisan consensus about higher education. 
Higher education is too expensive. Universities and colleges are not teaching what they should. And higher education is not producing the workforce America needs. Well, some of you may quibble with some of these points, the data are clear that trust and confidence in higher education are declining and that these opinions are widely held across the political spectrum in our nation. We therefore look to our university leaders to recommit to our public purpose. The Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890 that established our nation's land-grant colleges said, and I quote, were created to, quote, promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions in life. To rephrase that in our modern context, the American people expect our public universities to provide a high quality practical education to the full breadth of our society. Every student we enroll should achieve their full potential and graduate prepared to contribute to society, and there should be no disparities based on race, ethnicity, social class, or family income. This is possible, and yet it is not yet the norm across America today. So we, as university leaders and university citizens, are called to be elite without being elitist. Elite in our ability to educate students from every background an elite for impact our faculty, staff, and alumni will have across our nation and the world. Our public universities are an investment by the American people in the future of our country. They expect an education from our public universities to be accessible, to provide graduates with a pathway to a career that will more than justify the time and expense of a university education, and to provide our states and nation with the workforce needed to support freedom and prosperity for all. This is not too much to ask, and we must deliver. Our public universities have a history of being sources of innovation, opportunity, and change, even in times of adversity and great challenges. So let us rise once again to the challenge of being relevant and important to the future of our great nation. Michael Amaritas is the right person for this time. So I offer my congratulations to Carolina, and my most hearty congratulations to Michael and Euro. Best wishes and Godspeed. I want to thank the uh, Symphony Orchestra and Concert Choir for the beautiful music this morning. Uh, these students truly rec rec uh, represent the incredible talent we have here at the University of South Carolina. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and Dr. Michael Amaritas, the Board of Trustees has found the individual who meets and exceeds the qualifications needed to fulfill the opportunities currently awaiting the university. It was my privilege to chair the board's presidential candidate search committee in 2021. Over the course of some 34 listening sessions with the public and with stakeholders across the USC system, and through nearly 6,000 replies to a survey, the presidential candidate search committee gathered insights regarding the job of the president of the University of South Carolina. Those insights informed the committee's authoring of a leadership profile, a job description for the position of president of USC. That leadership profile was used in a, in a call for nominations and applications for, for the position of president. That profile even inspired interview questions asked of candidates for the position of president. That profile described the USC system and each of its campuses, the importance and impact of university research, the opportunities awaiting the 30th president of the university, and the qualifications sought in the 30th president. Dr. Amaritas is the right president at the right moment for the University of South Carolina system. And his actions since beginning work on July 1 of last year demonstrate this fact clearly. Please join me in thanking the members of the Presidential Candidate Search Committee for their work and for the Board of Trustees' decision to select Dr. Amaritas as the 30th President of the University of South Carolina.
this time, I invite Dr. Emeritus and Dr. Audrey Korsgaard, Chair of the Faculty Senate, to join me at the podium to assist with the, pres the presentation of the Presidential Medallion. We also welcome the First Lady, Dr. Iro Angalopulu and Maridas to join us. Dr. Michael Amaritas, the University of South Carolina's Board of Trustees is charged by the General Assembly on behalf of all people in this state to oversee a vital enterprise related to the quality of life in South Carolina. To that end, this university has been called a faithful index to the ambitions and fortunes of the state. As the Enabling Act of 1801 describes, this university prioritizes instruction of students in harmony with the entire state, and this morning's event is an acknowledgement of this university's public mission and its compact with all of our communities. Therefore, I now charge you to fulfill the responsibilities of the president of the University of South Carolina and to make real the opportunities on the horizon for this university, as described in this institution's Enabling Act of 1801, its mission statement, and the presidential leadership profile, which informed your selection. I further charge you to promote instruction, good order, and harmony within the entire state, to promote the dissemination of knowledge, cultural enrichment, and an enhanced quality of life, to lead a large and complex organization toward promotion of excellence in academics and research, to enact student-centered policies and practices for undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, to spur scholarly endeavors, creative activity, and clinical expertise, to increase institutional diversity and ensure the university is a welcoming place for all South Carolinians, to steward the university to operate with excellence, to innovate through partnerships and philanthropy, to assess and conquer new challenges, and to do all this with integrity and sound judgment, with eagerness to communicate with the university's diverse stakeholders and in conformity with the tenets of the Carolinian creed. It is now my privilege to bestow on you the presidential medallion, the emblem of the office of president, symbolizing the responsibilities that you have already borne admirably for the past six months. Will everyone who is able please rise? Dr. Michael Amaritas, by virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees by the General Assembly, acting on behalf of the people of the state, I hereby do install you as the 30th President of the University of South Carolina. If you willingly accept this challenge, accept it with this medallion, which designates you as the embodiment of the institution's power and authority. Congratulations, President Emeritus. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I accept the challenge you have presented with a strong sense of the responsibility that accompanies it. I am honored and humbled at the same time to guide and guard the University of South Carolina, and I'm prepared to lead this historic citadel of learning as we write together the next bright chapter in its long history. In short words, yes, I accept the challenge. <laughs> Chancellor, thank you. <laughs> Chancellor Jones and President Becker, thank you for your insightful remarks and for being a special part of our ceremony today. And I also want to thank all of other speakers who brought greetings from different groups of our community. Governor McMaster, it's a great honor 
we have you on the stage today. Your Eminence, Archbishop Eutidophoros, Your Excellency, Ambassador Papadopoulou, Mr. President of the South Carolina Senate, Mr. Speaker of the House, all of our elected officials, Congressman Wilson, and all of our members of the board, colleagues, friends, and members of the University of South Carolina community, thank you for honoring me, my family, and our university with your presence here today. I want to offer a special welcome to our 28th president and the former lady, our great friends for over 20 years, Harris Pastidis and Patricia Moore Pastidis. I want to thank you both, and I cannot figure, here is Patricia. I want to thank you both for, honor, for all that you have done for our university and for me and Iro. I would also like to recognize our two children, Aspasia, class of 2019, who is watching us today from Madison, Wisconsin, and Dimitri, class of 2022, who is here, as well as I, my uncle, Timos, and my cousin, Mia, who are with us. Their family are our only direct relatives that we have in this country. And finally, I would like to introduce you the new first lady of the university, the ideal partner in life for me and a great mother for our children, and the most intelligent, sensitive, passionate, caring, and elegant person I have ever met. She loves this university as much or even more than I do, and she has a very broad perspective as a student with two advanced degrees from USC, as a spouse of a faculty member, and as a mother of two USC students. She's also USC's newest cheerleader, and she's more excited than the students are during the sandstorm play. <laughs> Knowing all of this, I actually suspect that the board decided first to bring her back to USC, <laughs> and then they consider me, but they're too kind to tell me this. <laughs> Our first lady, Dr. Ro Angelopoulou, on your list. When Niro and I arrived in South Carolina in August of 1994, we knew very little about the university, the city, and the state. I know that many of you in this amphitheater were born and raised in this state and have multi-generational ties with USC. But there are also others in the audience who came here later in life, as we did. And likely, they had the same experience with us. Once you arrive here, slowly but steadily, this university, this city, and this state grow to become part of you. And as Pat Conroy describes it, South Carolina is a state of constant surprise, a state that on occasion can rise up and steal your soul with a magical moment. All of us who are connected to the University of South Carolina have the great privilege of experiencing these magical moments frequently on campus. And during our interactions with our students and our alumni, I missed these moments during the last few years, and I wanted to experience them again. And I did during this past fall. These magical moments are the ones who brought us back to South Carolina. Over the last few years, I have been frequently asked to talk to different groups, academic and in some cases non-academic, about university leadership. My opening comment in these discussions is that if you plan to be a university leader in today's environment, you must first think carefully about the reasons that led you to this decision and then, you should also check your sanity. <laughs> the reaction of the different groups is similar to your reaction and leads to very interesting discussions. But the two points that I'm trying to make from the very beginning is first, 
that academic leadership has to be one's calling because otherwise it's a disaster. And second, that we are in a very challenging period for our institutions of higher learning. When I was in high school, my classmates and I were frequently reminded by one of our history teachers about Alexander the Great, the superhero of our childhood, because we didn't have any Marvel books at that time. <laughs> Alexander said, I was indebted to my father for living, but to my teacher for living well. I'm not the son of a king, and I was not a student of Aristotle, as Alexander was, but I'm a proud product of public higher education, and indeed, I'm indebted to my many teachers for living well. I'm a first generation college student who was given the opportunity to pursue his dreams of earning an advanced degree in this country and becoming a teacher and a researcher at a great American public research university. And every one of these last four words, American public research and university have defined who I am. My calling, what makes my life meaningful, what puts a smile on my face every day and gives me the energy and the stamina that is needed to lead a large university is my passion and desire to give the same opportunity to every individual who works hard and wants to advance in life through knowledge. This should be at the heart of the mission of every public university. As Mark Becker said, over the last 20 years, we have experienced in our country an erosion of public trust and confidence in higher education. During this period, we have seen significant changes in societal and technological trends that have directly affected higher education, including the shifting demographics of our country, the rapid advances in technology, and the large increase in national and global mobility of students and scholars. These changes have strongly affected the work environment and expectations across all sectors of the economy, while creating unique challenges and opportunities as universities try to adjust their educational and research models to fit a new reality. The relatively slow response of higher education to these trends, as well as the increasing expectations of parents and students and the increasing cost of a college degree have contributed to a significant negative shift in public opinion about higher education, and Mark is right. This is bipartisan. At the same time, and this is the interesting part, at the same time, the need for a well-educated and diverse workforce is now greater than it has ever been in our history with a focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership. In the late first century AD, the Greek philosopher Plutarch, in his text Moralia, which one can call his philosophical manifesto, he wrote that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, it's a fire to be kindled. Not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. I find it amazing that 2,000 years later, this is a very relevant statement about modern higher education. Today, information that can fill a mind is readily available to everyone, anywhere, at any time. Furthermore, even solutions to specific problems are also readily available. As a college student 40 years ago, I took several courses and spent countless hours learning how to calculate the optimal size and the operating conditions of large units that they were used in the chemical, energy, or food industry. A task that could take days for even very experienced chemical engineers in the field. Today, and over, for over 20, 25 years by now, all of these problems can be solved in less than a minute after one enters the parameter into the right type of software. We no longer 
need to fill the mind with information or with algorithms and processes that lead to technical solutions. Instead, we need to prepare the mind for how to develop the right questions, what to do with the information provided, and how to apply the solutions. This is what separates and defines a well-educated workforce in our times. Our role in all our courses and extracurricular activities will have to be focused on kindling the fire of the mind for every student and unleashing their potential to innovate and to lead. Similarly, the importance of basic and applied research conducted by universities is much higher than it has ever been in the past. When I came to the United States 38 years ago, the global dominance of American research universities was unchallenged. This was the only reason I came from a coastal town in Greece to Wisconsin, and actually I stayed there after the first winter that I experienced. <laughs> but the landscape has changed during the last four decades. Europe, China, and even India have built significant research capacity. They have caught up with us, and in some areas, they may even be already ahead of us. Under these conditions, the future global competitiveness of our country and our state depends more and more on the success of our top research universities. At USC, we are eager to expand our research efforts, but focus it also on both local and global critical challenges. And we should not forget our obligation to also advance the humanities and the arts. I'll go back to Pat Conroy, who also said, the University of South Carolina has always played a role in the intellectual life of South Carolina. We also have a unique opportunity through our USC system to create a statewide innovation network, leveraging the expertise of the flagship campus with the local knowledge and relationship of the rest of our campuses, a network that will address local problems, support local industry, and inform local policies. And we are already moving in this direction. To regain the public trust, it is imperative to demonstrate the ability and willingness to innovate in all of our operations, innovate in the way we teach and mentor students inside and outside of the classroom, innovate in our research and scholarship efforts, and innovate in the way that we finance and conduct our operations. I aspire for USC to be known nationally and internationally as one of the cradles of academic innovation of our times, the same way that we are recognized today for our innovation in the late 60s and the early 70s under President Tom Jones when we created the first year student experience, the Honors College and the first international business program ahead of everybody else in the country. At the same time, we need to protect one of our biggest assets, our unique academic environment, an environment that brings together all those who wish to advance through knowledge, nurtures, recognizes, and rewards excellence, respects all opinions, and allow them to be expressed freely, and finally contributes to the improvement of the quality of life for our surrounding communities, especially the most vulnerable communities in our state. To protect this environment during this time of change, we need to protect our core values of access, inclusion, meritocracy, and service. I was thrilled to hear Governor McMaster last week as he started his inaugural address, referring to the young people who were on the steps of the Capitol and committing to creating an environment in which all of them can reach their full potential. Governor, we're going to be your strongest ally in this effort. We will continue to provide the best education and the best college experience to the young people in this state, and also to the not so young who are catching up later in their lives. 
who will protect access and affordability, who will innovate in our course offerings and academic credentials, preparing our students to be outstanding professionals and engaged citizens, and who will work with you and with your agencies, assisting in your economic development efforts and contributing to an advanced knowledge economy for the state. I agree with you that education, as you put it, is a pillar of prosperity and happiness. And I want all of our graduates to stay, work, prosper, and live a good life here in South Carolina. I want them to experience all of these magical moments that this state has to offer. When the University of South Carolina was established in 1801, public higher education was an experiment in this country. We're all very proud of the fact that South Carolina agreed early to be part of this experiment and to be one of the first public universities in the nation. And despite the many challenges and difficulties we face during these past 220 years, this experiment has been successful since for many generations, the University of South Carolina has been building the future of this state by educating its leaders and contributing to improving the quality of the life of its citizens. Today, as we reflect on the past, evaluate the present, and plan for the future, we also have the opportunity to renew our commitment to our state and to our community. Together with our Board of Trustees, together with my academic colleagues who are wearing their robes today, together with our staff members and our students, and together with our alumni, our friends and supporters, we commit to building an even better future for our city, for our state, and for our country. This is, after all, the common thread through the 29 presidencies that predate mine. This is our collective legacy, and this is our greatest contribution. Thank you all for this great honor and confidence in me. May God bless the University of South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and remain standing for the benediction by His Eminence Archbishop Elpithophoros of America followed by the first verse of the alma mater, the words of which are printed on page 10 of your program. Then please remain at your seats until the platform party, as well as the members of the Amaritas family, members of the Board of Trustees, and other special guests who are seated in the front row have exited the auditorium. Following the recessional, please join us in the lobby for a brief reception with music provided by the Carolina Pep Band. God bless America. Let us pray. O oh God, the unmoved mover of all, that is and shall ever be, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. We give thanks to you for this investiture today of your faithful servant, President Michael Amiridis, through whom you will continue to inspire and encourage this great institution of learning and culture. Grant unto him and to all his co-workers enlightenment from above, so that they may lead the University of South Carolina with grace, passions, discernment, and above all, wisdom forevermore. Bless all their endeavors for the benefit of all, keeping them safe and secure in the knowledge of your ineffable love and mercy for every human being. And as our good and loving master, bless us all as we depart in one accord for the good of this school. Make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace, prosperity, concord, and unity, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>